All right, so let's uh, start by reading. We're going to go ahead and read the first six verses of chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, and then we're going to come back, and as I said, uh, we're going to cover uh, a part of verse 3 and just uh, see how far we get with all of this. But let's read the first six verses of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Now, one thing I want to encourage you to do is, is read through this epistle. Read through it this week from, uh, you know, it's only four chapters long. And so just read through this epistle. I believe it'll bless you. It'll help prepare you uh, for the things that we're going to be talking about as well. And so again, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, it reads, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded is in you also. Therefore I remind you, to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. All right, so let's uh, go to our notes now, and let's uh, just begin expounding on some of these verses and, and see how far we get and uh, see what else the Lord might have us uh, get into tonight. So we read, first of all, the introduction. Is everybody with me? Now, one thing I want to mention to you, if you are with us with 1 Timothy, some of the things that I'm going to share tonight in this introduction were also shared with 1 Timothy because uh, we're talking about the same author. We're talking about the same recipient who was Timothy, right? And so some of these things, you know, when we talk about Timothy, etc., it's going to be the same because, again, we're talking about the same guy. Uh, but it's been so long ago uh, that we started 1 Timothy that I think it'll still be uh, somewhat uh, uh, fresh to you. And so we read the introduction. It says, today as we begin a new study through the second letter Paul writes to Timothy, Timothy. Uh, this letter is, is second of what are called the pastoral epistles, which includes 1 Timothy and Titus as well. The reason they're called this is summed up by the following excerpt, which reads this way, and this is from, uh, you'll see, Encountering the New Testament, the footnotes down to the bottom. It said, first, all three letters show pastoral concern for their recipients, Timothy and Titus. Second, all three deal with pastoral matters involving the care of souls and the orderly conduct of God's people in the church, as well as in the world. And so, you know, the idea is that uh, both Timothy and Titus were acting as pastors, all right? Uh, Titus was sent to a place called Crete, and Timothy, as we've already mentioned to you uh, in Titus, Times gone by when we were studying First Timothy anyway. Uh, Timothy was at this point in time a pastor in the city of Ephesus, a spiritual leader in Ephesus. And, and you know, just so you know, uh, tradition says, and no one knows this for absolute certainty, but tradition says uh, that Timothy actually was stoned eventually there uh, in the city of Ephesus uh, because he got into arguments uh, with uh, some of these idolaters who worshipped uh, the idol Diana. Some of you remember reading about Diana. It's mentioned in the, in the book of Acts and what have you. This uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, idol that they worshipped, Diana, uh, was a powerful powerful thing in the lives of the people there. And so again, they're facing, uh, you know, the church in Ephesus is facing a lot of opposition uh, because that idolatry had such a foothold uh, in, their, in their culture even. It was a cultural thing as well as their religion. And so uh, it was such a, a powerful force in the minds and hearts and the worldview of those Ephesian uh, people. And so again, you know, you come in here with uh, a gospel, you come here with a message that is totally opposed uh, to any kind of idolatry, and it's going to ruffle some feathers, isn't it, right? It's going to ruffle some feathers. And so uh, this is sort of a picture uh, of the environment that Timothy is dealing with here. Now, as we go on, with our notes, unlike the letters to the Thessalonians, which were some of the earliest letters of Paul, all three of these letters, that's 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, are believed to have been written near the end of Paul's life. Scholars agree that Paul wrote this letter shortly before his death and is the last epistle Paul wrote. Therefore, since he, is probably, he was probably executed before uh, Nero's death in A.D. 68, the letter was written somewhere around A.D. 66 or 67. The following quote gives us an idea of the setting surrounding the writing of this letter. And this quote is from a commentary called Christ-Centered uh, Exposition Commentary. You can see that footnote down at the bottom as well. It reads this way. In 2 Timothy, Paul focused on the personal ministry of Timothy himself more than the ordering of the church. According to tradition, Paul wrote this second letter from an underground chamber in Rome's uh, Manertime prison. 
Based on the end of 2 Timothy, it seems Paul had already received a court hearing, 2 Timothy 4, 16 through 18, and expected to be executed soon, chapter 4, 6 through 8. Even though Paul mentioned that Luke was with him in chapter 4 and verse 11, we still picture the war-torn apostle alone and cold. He wanted the cloak, his scrolls, especially the parchment, and to see Timothy. In light of his writing context, the passion and personal tone of 2 Timothy is understandable. And so Paul was in a, a bad way in terms of physical, but in spiritual things, uh, he was as strong as ever. Uh, he knew his God, and he stood strong. Now, we're going to see that there is, uh, in this epistle, uh, kind of a no of sadness uh, coming from Paul, but it's not a sadness necessarily because he was going to die. It seems that he was ready for that, uh, but it seems it's a sadness because he doesn't want to depart and leave those friends and co-workers in the faith uh, behind and all that kind of thing. Paul was a strong man in the faith, wasn't he? Amen? And, and so, uh, uh, Paul, you might uh, read in this some um, uh, you know, some farewell type of uh, ideas and some sadness in the sense that he's going to uh, be martyred. He's going to go home, be with the Lord. But again, it wasn't because he had a fear of death. In fact, we just read in verse 7, he told Timothy, uh, God's not given you the spirit of fear, right? And so certainly the apostle Paul wasn't accepting any spirit of fear either, even though he was imprisoned and all of that. Uh, no, he was still in faith. He was still strong in his relationship with God. But yet physically, uh, he was in a, a cold, uh, dark dungeon and, uh, you know, experiencing all of the uh, things that might, that, that might involve, you know, the, the dampness, the possibly cockroaches, you know, you don't want to go into all the details, rats and whatever. Uh, but uh, in any case, though, spiritually, uh, you know, he knew who he was and he knew his God. Amen. All right. So now let's talk about who is Timothy. As we go on with this letter A, he is usually considered a convert of Paul, along with his mother and grandmother, during Paul's first missionary journey. And I give the scriptures for that that you can check out as well. Uh, letter B, Timothy was uh, from Lystra in the Roman province of Galatia. And during Paul's second visit to this area, he decided to take Timothy along on his travels. But because Timothy had a Greek father and Jewish mother, he had never been circumcised. And in order to not hinder his ministry to the Jews, he circumcised, Paul did. Paul circumcised Timothy. And you can see that in Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. And so, uh, as you have probably known already, especially if you study 1 Timothy with us, uh, Timothy became uh, a protege to the Apostle Paul. One of his, uh, one of his uh, greatest sons in the faith was this young man by the name of Timothy, all right? And as we just read, his father was Greek, his mother was Jewish, uh, but he was raised in the Jewish faith. Uh, we don't know uh, really anything about Timothy's father for sure. History doesn't even uh, mention uh, anything about him to, that's uh, for fact anyway. Uh, there might be some tradition about his father, but his mother, his grandmother, as we already read and as you already heard on that video, had great influence uh, in terms of the scripture, in terms of his relationship with God, again, being raised in the Jewish faith, uh, was of course a stepping stone in order to come into being a believer in Jesus Christ or Yeshua HaMashiach, which is Jesus the Messiah. Right, and so it was a stepping stone for that uh, because, as we uh, as we uh, will read, uh, he was very much grounded in the Old Testament scriptures, and so that was a great foundation for Timothy. As we read on with this and let her see, Paul called Timothy his beloved and faithful son in the Lord. First Corinthians four seventeen, and then conferred with Philippians two twenty two, First Timothy one two, Second Timothy one two, which we saw uh, he's called his beloved son. We read and his fellow worker in the gospel, Romans sixteen twenty one, and then you can confer with First Thessalonians three two, First Corinthians sixteen ten, and Philippians two twenty two. Going on from there, he became a very close friend of Paul's. Doctor Gordon Fee writes this as his son. Of course, that's son in the faith, right? As his son, he became Paul's most intimate and enduring companion who followed him closely, and then he gives scriptures, shared his point of view, and could articulate the way, his ways to the churches. And then after the scripture references, it says he also collaborated in six of Paul's extant letters, 1st and 6th Thessalonians, 2nd Corinthians, Colossians, Philemon, Philippians, and uh, it mentions him in Romans 16, verse 21. In the present letters... 
And this is speaking of First and Second Timothy. In the present letters, he is on yet another assignment, this time a most difficult one. He has been left in Ephesus to stop some false teachers who are in the process of undoing the church as a viable Christian alternative for that city. And other uh, scholars uh, seem to think uh, that even between the time of First Timothy, the first letter to Timothy, to the second set, uh, letter to Timothy, which uh, they weren't written too far apart, um, months, maybe a year, maybe a little more, uh, but it seems that the problem of these false teachers had increased exponentially. It had uh, gone a lot further with the teaching. And if you were with us for First Timothy, and also it was mentioned in that video as well, I'm glad he got that right in that video. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, a lot of there was some of the women that had been deceived by these false teachers. And that's why in 1 Timothy, many believe the reason why Paul said that women should not teach uh, and that kind of thing or or have authority over men, it's talking about a specific problem in that church at Ephesus that there was a woman or some women that had been duped by false teachers and they therefore were teaching falsely as well. And so we dealt with that idea uh, that it wasn't an overall thing, which seems to be a big uh, subject amongst Christianity today. Should women teach uh, men and, and even pastor and all that kind of thing? Uh, you know, people get off into these, these tangents when the main thing needs to stay the main thing, right? And that is we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen? And so again, uh, in First Timothy, when that was addressed about women not teaching and that kind of thing, it's talking about a specific problem of women teaching some false doctrine that they had uh, been duped by with these false teachers. And the same kind of idea goes with 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where he talks about a similar thing as well. All right. So in any case, let's move on from here because I could get into that soapbox and we don't want to do that because we'll never get done. Right. And so as it goes on, Gordon Fee, we we read all of that. Let's go to letter D. At this time, Timothy was pastoring the church in the city of Ephesus. And and he might not have been, you know, different scholars say different things. He might not have been the pastor, but he was certainly involved with pastoring. And of course, as most of you probably know, uh, that idea of pastor was never meant to be a title. It was meant to be a job description. And so certainly Timothy who was called, uh, at another time he was called an apostle, which was, we'll get into that in a few moments as well, Uh, but he was definitely pastoring or involved with helping to pastor uh, the church in Ephesus and bring correction uh, to some of the issues that were going on there. And all of you probably know uh, that in the New Testament, over and over and over again, uh, whether it's uh, Paul, whether it's John, whether it's Peter, uh, Jude, and James, I mean, practically every writer of any of the epistles, to one extent or another, had to deal with false doctrine, false teaching that was trying to infiltrate the church, different kinds of false teaching. And, uh, and so that's still the case today, I want you to know. And, uh, you know, I've been, uh, you know, I try to stay studied up and read well and, you know, well read and all that kind of thing. And one of the things that's going on in our nation today is this thing called progressive Christianity. And progressive Christianity is not Christianity. Progressive Christianity is the embracing of the culture of our world and mixing it with a type of Christianity that is totally out of line with the Word of God. And so we need to be very cautious about that. And again, I don't want to go into a tangent, uh, but we need to be watchful of that kind of thing, all right? And so anyway, let's go on with this uh, Roman numeral. Number three, uh, purpose and relevance of this letter. I thought this was good, and I thought it summed it up uh, fairly well. The purpose and the relevance of this letter, and this is from uh, opening up uh, uh, 2 Timothy, a book, and again, the notes are down below. It says, this epistle is immensely relevant for the life of today's church. It was written when Christians were suffering persecution under the emperor Nero, and most of you know that Nero was a nut. All right. If you know anything about Nero, man, he had demons, I'm convinced. And when falsehood had become fashionable, notice now, under the persecution of the emperor Nero, and when falsehood had become fashionable within the church itself. I mean, I'm going to pause there just for a moment, but does that not sound like the world in which we live right now? Not only in the church, and that would apply to progressive Christianity and and maybe some other elements and whatever, but also the world itself. Falsehood is rampant. People are believing the lies, aren't they? I mean, there's so much deception. Of course, Jesus predicted uh, that deception would run rampant uh, prior to His coming, right? And we see that happening, and so therefore we know that the answer Uh, The remedy for deception is we stay in the Word of God and we adhere to the Word of God. I'm talking about the whole counsel of God. Amen. Let the Scripture interpret Scripture. Let let there be context to the Scripture and understanding it and that kind of thing and not compromising truth. 
in order to be, as it states in this, this particular word, fashionable. We don't need to stay fashionable. Let's stay in line with God. Amen? And then going on, it says, But Paul urges Timothy not to yield to the pressures of the age, but to, quote, preach the word in season and out of season, and to remain faithful to the apostolic faith. That is a message we need to take to heart today. Don't you agree? Amen? Amen. And so I thought that that was a a great quote and so applicable uh, for the world that we live in as well. And so, again, just showing and confirming uh, that the Bible is still as relevant as it ever was in the day in which we live. Amen? A lot of things have not changed. People are the same, basically. And, uh, you know, we know the devil's the same. And just remember, Satan is the great deceiver, deceives people. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6 and verse 12, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, right? And so Satan is the deceiver, deceives the deceivers as far as the human deceivers. And so we need to do everything we can to help them as well. People are not the enemy. Satan is the enemy. And those that are being used by him are really, they are, they are victims of the enemy, even if they don't realize it, right? And most of them don't realize it. So we come now uh, to page two and Roman numeral number four, exposition to chapter one. And so letter A, verses one and two, it says again, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, so we start off with this, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, The word apostle means to send a message, uh, and then, uh, you know, it it gives a reference there, but that's nothing that applies to us. Uh, It's not a a reference in Scripture. It has to do with the reference book that this was taken from. To send a message, one who is sent with a message. That's the basic idea of an apostle. But in the ancient Greek culture, the word evolved in meaning. I'm going to pause there just for a minute. And there's a lot of different meanings over a period of time. Some of you uh, may have heard me share uh, that at one time it was a, like a nautical term, the apostle. Uh, when uh, ships would go uh, to other parts of the world in order to colonize another part of the world, uh, that ship or ships, group of ships were called apostles. The ships were, and the admiral of that, that uh, co- uh, convoy, if you will, of ships, he was called oftentimes an apostle. They were sent ones to go and colonize another area, and the idea was that they would go as representatives of their motherland or fatherland, uh, motherland usually, unless it was Hitler, fatherland, right? But anyway, uh, they would become representatives of the country that they were being sent from, and they would colonize and make, uh, if you will, or the goal was to almost duplicate where they came from as representatives and ambassadors. Does that make sense to you? All right, so they would colonize, and they, that was one of the meanings of apostles went on. Now, you can see the, 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 the similarity here because an apostle in the Bible, even though there might be different kinds of apostles, an apostle was many times sent to an area to evangelize, to take the kingdom of God, representing their king, Jesus Christ. Amen? And so they would represent there and they'd extend uh, the kingdom of God and, if you will, spiritually colonize an area with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense to you? All right. And so that was one of the meanings that uh, came from that. And then going on uh, with this, it says, it says uh, in the quote here uh, from uh, Bill Scheidler, he includes the following meaning in his book on apostles. And I'm at that quote now. An apostle later came to be an official ambassador or an emissary for a higher authority. As such, he was to be the embodiment and true representation of the sender. The quote sent one was to be absolutely faithful to the purposes and the intentions of the sender. Okay? And so that was the basic idea of an apostle. Now, I do want to say to you that there are in the scripture different kinds of apostles. All right? We know that, uh, for example, if you look up here, I think I can get this thing working. All right, we know there were original 12 apostles or disciples, right? And, of course, Judas uh, went away from Jesus and, and committed suicide, whatever. I believe that he was replaced by a guy by the name of Matthias. You don't have to agree with that if you don't want to. Uh, but there are 12, if you remember, in the book of Revelation, there's going to be 12 thrones for the 12 apostles, right? So one of them replaced them. And so I think it was Matthias in Acts chapter 1. But anyway, they were uh, referred to as the 12 apostles of the Lamb, right? 
And so they are a, a different category of apostle. I probably should have wrote apostle instead of disciples there. They were a different category of apostles. There are no more quote-unquote apostles of the Lamb that experienced what they experienced and walked with Jesus the way they walked with Jesus and, and were eyewitnesses of his, of his life, of his death, of his burial and his resurrection, of the apostles of the Lamb. But, you know, the Bible does talk about others as well, like maybe some 23 other apostles. And uh, here's a group of post-resurrection apostles. Barnabas is called an apostle. Adronicus and Junius, which is many times understood as Junia. Now, this is controversial today as well for the same reason I mentioned before, because Junia is a feminine name. And so it's understood by some that Junia was probably a woman apostle. God forbid. God forbid. Uh, but anyway, let's go on. We've got Apollos, who's called an apostle. James, the Lord's brother. And the scriptures are there. You can write them down if you want. Silvanus and Timothy are called apostles. I mentioned that Timothy was. Titus, Epaphroditus. And then, of course, everybody knows the apostle Paul, right? And so here's a number of them in addition to the 12 apostles of the Lamb. These are often referred to as post-resurrection apostles. Now, there's also another truth, and that is it's an ongoing gift in the church. Because Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, it says that uh, he that descended, or, or he that ascended, first of all, descended into the lower parts of the earth. And then it talks about he that ascended. When he did ascend, he gave gifts unto men. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. Basically, the idea is till Jesus comes again. Amen. And so it was for that whole period of time. There's still apostolic ministry today. There's no more, you know, no more uh, apostles of the Lamb. And there are no more writing apostles. We're not writing any more scripture, right? There's no more writing apostles. So that's, again, the idea is not all apostles are the same, just like not all pastors are the same, not all evangelists are the same. And so, but we know there's no more writing apostles. Nobody's writing scriptures anymore. Right? That would be dangerous, wouldn't it? But yet others here, like Apollos, he never wrote any scripture. Adron Adronicus, Junius, Barnabas, uh, you know, Silvanus, Timothy never wrote any. He received some, etc. You know, they weren't writing apostles. The apostle Paul had a very, uh, a very unique ministry. And of course, there were others. Uh, James, the Lord's brother. The, the epistle of James was written. Most would agree by James, the Lord's half-brother, right? Etc. Uh, but, you know, there's no more writing apostles. But yet there's apostolic ministry. There's still those that feel called of God to be sent to areas to go propagate, represent, be ambassadors for Christ and establish works and churches and things like that. In fact, many that we call missionaries today, which is not found in the Bible, could be called apostles. You understand if we were going to use more of a biblical term. And so, you know, again, it's till he comes again that all five if you will, of those ministry gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher were to remain in the church. Different levels, not all the same category of apostle, but nevertheless, uh, they still uh, were, are considered apostles. You, you understand what I'm saying, right? All right. And so let, let's go on with this now. <clears throat> we come to number two. And Paul says this concerning the fact that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. In fact, before I do that, everybody knows I didn't go into it because, again, you can see I came to page two and the end of page two, and we can't go beyond two pages, although we did break that a few times, didn't we? All right. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, you know, Jesus Christ, it says he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the name Jesus, means Savior or Deliverer, right? And Christ is the, is the uh, parallel of the same as Messiah, which means anointed one. And so Jesus Christ, the anointed Savior or the anointed Deliverer. Thank God he delivered us from the power of Satan and the power of sin. Isn't that right? All right. And so we didn't mention that in the notes, but just so you know that as well. All right. So, you know, I don't put everything in the notes because if I did, then you wouldn't need me. All right. I want you to need me. All right. I'm just kidding. But anyway. So let, let's go on with this. By the will of God. After coming to Christ, it's no longer a matter of what we want, but what He wants in our lives. On the Mount of Olives, Jesus prayed to the Father and states, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Luke twenty two forty two. And so that should be also our, our prayer as well, right? Not my will, but your will be done. Because once we belong to Christ, it's not what we want anymore. That's why I always told my kids, I hope they listened. 
I always told them, you know, because other parents, they'll tell their kids, you know, you can be anything you want to be. I never told my kids that. You can be anything God wants you to be, is what I always said to them, because they needed to uh, fulfill the plan that God had for their lives, right? And uh, because if I wanted to be anything I wanted to be, I would not be a pastor. I didn't want to be a pastor. I didn't want to be a preacher. I didn't like preachers. I, but anyway, you know, it's not my will. It's what God's will is. That's the way we're supposed to live this Christian life. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's go on with this then. Number three, according to, so again, Apostle Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. The word according here means with regard to or in relation to. The word life uh, here means of the absolute fullness of life, both essential and ethical, which belongs to God. So obviously it's zoe. Many of you probably heard the, the word zoe, the God kind of life, right? And so going on with our notes here. So obviously Paul is talking about eternal life, which not only includes a quantity of life, but also a higher quality of life, which is the life of God. And so it's not just, a, it's not just living forever, it's a, it's a new life as well, right? It's a new life. The Scripture talks about, you know, that, we've, that we're to walk in newness of life in Romans uh, chapter 6, uh, because now we have this resurrection life. It's resurrection life. Is everybody with me here? I, I mean, this resurrection life, it starts on the inside. We were spiritually resurrected the moment we accepted Jesus, Right? And because we were spiritually resurrected when we accepted Him, that's sort of the down payment, of, if you will, of a physical resurrection that's going to come in the future if we die physically before He comes again. Amen? Amen. And so uh, I'm more enthusiastic about it than you, but that's all right. That's all right. all right. So as we go on with this, it says, so obviously Paul is talking about eternal life, which not only includes a quantity of life, but also a higher quality of life, which is the life of God. Then the quote, a new living translation of 2 Timothy 1, 1 reads this way. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I have been sent out to tell others about the life he has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. That kind of makes it a little bit more easy to understand, doesn't it, right? that he was saying, according to the promise of life, he says, I've been sent as an apostle, a sent one out. I've been sent out to tell others about the life. Isn't that a great, I mean, that's our, to one extent or another, that's all of our calling, isn't that right? To tell others of the, the life that is promised when one accepts Christ by faith. Amen. I want to talk to you about life. Can I talk to you about life? <laughs> If you ask people that, that's another question you'd ask people, right? Here in the diner and the waitress, hey, can I talk to you about life? I wonder what they'd say to that. You know, I've asked them, do you ever think about God? Well, that's one thing, but let me talk to you about life. There's an idea, all right? And they said, no, I don't want to talk about life. That's going to scare them. That, that'll probably scare them away right there, I'll tell you. Anyway, we go to number uh, four, to Timothy, all right? So he says who he is, not that Timothy needed to know, but again, he said it anyway, to Timothy... A beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace. Paul expresses his affection to Timothy in referring to him as a beloved son or a son that he loved, right? Beloved means loved. My loved son. The word grace means a favorable attitude towards someone or something, favor or goodwill. We can kind of focus on maybe that word favor. And so uh, Paul is pronouncing favor to Timothy, uh, a beloved son, I want you to be favored. I want you to be uh, experiencing the favor of God. And then the word peace, I know we skip mercy, we'll get to that in a minute. The word peace is defined as the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever sort that it is. And so basically this idea of tranquility, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what life is bringing, a supernatural tranquility or peace and sense of well-being that comes by way of the presence of God who lives within us. Amen? All right, so he's praying that in a sense. He said, to Timothy, my beloved son, the son who I love, grace, mercy, and peace to you, son. Grace, mercy, and peace. Favor, tranquility, and then mercy as well. And uh, as we read out in our notes here, it says it's pointed out by several scholars that the word mercy is added in the salutation of the two letters to Timothy. Most translations do not include it in Titus 1.4, although the New King James does. So if you have a different translation then the New King James or the King James, it may not include the word mercy in Titus chapter 1 and verse 4, but 
in First and Second Timothy, it does. And I thought that was interesting. As we read on this notice, the word mercy means to show kindness or concern for someone in serious need. Dr. Warren Wiersbe writes this, It's worth noting that Paul added mercy to his greetings when he wrote to the pastors. And he gives those scriptures. He includes Titus because he's probably reading from the King James Version. Paul knew that pastors need mercy. All right. You know, I I read uh, something that uh, Charles Sturgeon or Spurgeon wrote. You know, he was called the Prince of Preachers, right? He's a Calvinist, so I don't quote him too much. Uh, But anyway, uh, but, uh, you know, he wrote something about that same idea that pastors need mercy. And he talks about uh, this idea of, you know, with all of my faults and my flaws and my mistakes and my errors, I need mercy from the people, right? I need mercy from the people. And so, you know, it's not it's not advocating sin or justifying sin, but it's just saying that a lot of times the people People of the congregation, none of you, but congregation expects more from a pastor than sometimes he's able to even deliver. Isn't that right? Because nobody is perfect in every single way. And, and you know, a lot of times their kids, pastor's kids, you know, they go astray because they were, so much was expected of them, like they're going to be perfect kids, you know. So uh, it's sad, but, you know, I think there's some truth to the idea. And again, if uh, the Spirit of God influenced uh, Paul to write this, this added idea of mercy in First and Second Timothy, is, it is interesting that none of the other epistles, when he does the salutation, he always, if not always, almost always includes grace and peace, but only in First and Second Timothy for sure. And maybe in Titus, he includes mercy as well uh, because they were pastors. So anyway, and I'll tell you another reason why. When you think about this circumstance, where Timothy is surrounded by all the uh, adversaries, if you will, all the opposition, the pagans and, and you know idolaters, etc., and all that was. I mean, he is the head. He's out there in the front lines, if you will, and, and it is part of the front lines. You know, who are the who are the human adversaries going to attack first? The human adversaries are going to attack the one on the front lines, right? Which we usually would be the pastor or leaders of a local church. So they need some maybe extra mercy there. All right. And so now we come to uppercase B in verse 3. It says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day. And so we're not going to be able to do this entire verse tonight because I want to talk about this idea of a pure conscience. And notice it says in number one, whom I serve with a pure conscience. Uh, The word pure means pertaining to being virtually clean or pure. And the word conscience means the psychological faculty which can distinguish between right and wrong or moral sensitivity. Now, some of you might remember, it's been quite some time, the word conscience has the idea, you know, the word science is there, co-science. The word science is a word for knowledge. And so conscience has the idea from its original meaning of co-knowledge co-knowledge. Now, when you think about this, now, I've never heard anybody teach along this line, but when I think about co-knowledge, and I think about the scriptures talking about conscience so often, uh, you know, whether it be 1st, 2nd Timothy, whether it be, uh, uh, you know, Hebrews, which we might turn to in a few moments and things like that, uh, you know, it talks about, in Romans, it talks about, you know, uh, people that, uh, you know, that eat meat, you know, and yet it hurts their conscience because those, that meat was offered to idols, you understand. And so uh, he's saying to those believers that are free from that guilt, uh, you know, don't eat the meat even though it doesn't mean anything really. But to those that, whose conscience bothers them, don't eat for their conscience sake. And so you have to wonder, well, why would one believer's conscience bother them about this and another believer's conscience not bother them about this? Well, in my mind, I think of this idea of co-knowledge, and the, and the idea is, in my mind, that co-knowledge would be like spirit and soul. Our spirit is that part that's been renewed by the Spirit of God, made a new creation in Christ, but yet we have a soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions that still need to be renewed to the Word of God. And so, in one sense, we have knowledge that's spiritual knowledge that uh, comes, and, and, and we're made a new creation, we understand spiritual understanding, but yet we still have a mind that still is carrying over some knowledge from when we knew nothing, like in the sense of the idolaters who got saved and the meat offered to idols still bothered them to eat it. You you understand? Because their minds had to be renewed to it still. Does that make any sense to you at all? And so that's why, in my mind, as we understand co-knowledge and conscience, why some 
believers' conscience bothers them over some things, and another believer's won't. But yet, those who, who, you know, biblically, if there's nothing wrong with it biblically, but yet they have a freedom. The Bible says, don't let your liberty give occasion to the flesh and not to purposely offend a brother who's weaker. Does that make sense? And, you know, we're not going to all the scriptures about it, but I think that there's something to that, uh, that idea of conscience, co-knowledge, spirit and soul, and how, you know, our mind progressively being renewed comes more and more in agreement with our spirit that's been instantly made new, right? If you hold your place there just for a minute to Hebrews. But anyway, in Hebrews chapter 9, beginning with verse 11. Now, you know that in Hebrews, Hebrews compares the Mosaic covenant or the covenant given to Moses with the new covenant through Jesus, right? And so here in Hebrews chapter 9, beginning with verse, uh, verse uh, uh, blah, let's start with verse 6. Are you there? It says, Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. So that's the Mosaic covenant with the tabernacle of Moses, right? That he's referring to. We can't go into detail about that right now. But, but into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which means he went with blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. So if you remember how it worked with the tabernacle, the tabernacle was a, was a big old tent, right? And in that big old tent, uh, there was the uh, candlestick, uh, which, uh, you know, was really a type or a prefigurement of Jesus being the light of the world. We've got the table of showbread. I mean, you know, Jesus is the bread of life, right? And we've got the altar of incense uh, where they burnt incense. And, and that seems to represent prayer unto God. And then there was a, a veil. And it, was more, it wasn't a sheer veil. It was more like a big curtain and very thick. The, the temple later on, Herod's temple, had a veil about four inches thick. Now, the tabernacle, maybe not so thick. I, I don't know for sure, but probably not. But on the other side of that veil what was another room in that huge tent, which was the most holy place. The first room was the holy place. But then there was the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was, where God dwelt in an intense way, right, between uh, the golden cherubim or angels that was sitting on top of that Ark of the Covenant, and there was the, the mercy seat was in between those two uh, uh, golden uh, angels on top of that. Isn't that right? The mercy seat, the seat of mercy, right? And God dwelt between the cherubim, the Scripture says, in, in an intense way. Now, I know, you know, you, you say, how, how can God dwell there? Well, you know, don't try to figure out how this all works because we know that God is everywhere too, don't we? But yet there was something about the presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant. But once a year, we just read, once a year, the high priest would enter in beyond, beyond the first room, into that second room, but he wouldn't go without blood. He'd go with blood, the blood of the sacrificial animals to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat in order to cover the sins of the people, right? Are you following me? Am I explaining it well enough? All right, so, so he's talking about that, but notice now, it says... In verse 8 now, it says the Holy Spirit, this is Hebrews 9, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all, or the most holy place, that second room, was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic. I'm reading from New King James. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. And so it's saying under the Old Testament, under that Mosaic covenant, the conscience could not be changed. And in this case, it would be, you know what? There's no spiritual renewal. There's no change on the inside. It's all about covering sin with the innocent blood of animals, isn't it, right? But then he goes on and he says this. It says, but Christ, in verse 11 came as the high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place. Now, what is that referring to? That's referring to heaven. All right? It's referring to heaven. He entered the most holy place, not a literal tabernacle or tent, but heaven itself he entered with his own blood. Once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Verse 13, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience 
from dead works to serve the living God. And then verse 15, And for this reason He is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And so it tells us there that, that through Christ's blood being offered, now our conscience can be purified or cleansed. Well, what part of the conscience was cleansed? If the conscience is your spirit and soul together, then what part of the conscience was cleansed from dead works? It was your spirit the moment you accepted Christ, right? And then from that point, you have to get your mind renewed, that other part of co-knowledge, if that makes sense to you. That's my understanding of it. And boy, did I ever labor over attempting to understand conscience over the years, I've labored over this, and I've come to some of this understanding a long time ago. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but there seems to be, it seems to come together with this idea of conscience, co-knowledge, and why some believers' conscience bothers them over things where another one's won't. It's just a conscience is complex. It's complex, all right? But anyway, let's go on with this uh, last quote, and then we'll stop for tonight. This last quote uh, says this, and this is from Gordon Fee once again. It says, The conscience is the capacity or seat of moral consciousness common to all people, gives Scripture. In Paul's earlier letters, Romans 1 and 2 Corinthians only, the conscience arbitrates one's own and others' actions. See especially 1 Corinthians 8-10. through 10. But it is also clear that it can be informed either by one's pagan past or present existence in Christ. In the P.E., I had to look up what he was referring to. That's the Phillips translation, all right, because in the beginning of this book, he tells what the abbreviations mean. So this is the Phillips translation. In the P.E., the term conscience is often, as here, accompanied by a descriptive adjective, good, pure, and seared. Let me pause there. You remember in 1 Timothy chapter 4, it talks about, you know, that, that the Spirit speaks expressly. In the last days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And then it goes on uh, that, they'll, that their very conscience will be seared as with a hot iron. Remember that? And he's talking about those that were believers, their conscience being seared or cauterized, desensitized. All right, is what the idea is there, desensitized. Implying the seed of moral decision-making to have been purified by Christ or seared or defiled by Satan. And then it says, 1 Timothy 4, 2, Titus 1, 15 through 16. It is clear from the context and from 119 that a pure heart and a good conscience are synonymous ideas. All right, so again, he basically, I think, is trying to say something like what I was trying to say. The idea that the conscience, even though it's made pure in Christ, it can be tainted in terms of our thinking by ideas being received into our minds that are not, in, not consistent with the Word of God. All right, and so again... We saw or mentioned 1 Timothy chapter 4 and talks about the idea of seducing spirits, doctrines of demons, infiltrating and, and uh, messing up the thinking of believers because it says they're departing from the faith. So it's believers in that context that are receiving seducing spirits or what they're teaching and doctrines of demons and their conscience is being seared. They're becoming desensitized. And so in my mind, that means their minds are being, if you will, seduced by wrong doctrine. And of course, in 2 Timothy, we're going to see that same thing as we've already mentioned uh, with this as well, uh, that the, the, the infiltration in the church of false teaching uh, can cause people to have a, a conscience that is not pure because now they're thinking falsely concerning God, concerning Scripture, and things such as that.